How are y'all doing? Good. How are you? I am doing fine. Um, I'm Liz Booth. I'm manager of the Watershed Planning and Monitoring Program at George EPD. My program is responsible for setting water quality standards. So that includes setting nutrient standards, which are coming. Um, we have a group, a couple of groups that go out and monitor the waters of the state. We have a group that's located in the Tipton office, and they monitor um, this area. Um, we then have a person that assesses all of that data to determine whether it's meeting the water quality standards. If it doesn't meet the water quality standards, we have to do what's called a TMDL, total maximum daily load. So we do those for waters that are not um, meeting their water quality standards. We also have a group that does waste load allocation. So if you come in and you want a new point source or you want to expand your point source, that group does the computer modeling associated with that to determine what those permit limits are going to be. So, that's my responsibility. Um, when it came to the statewide water plan, our responsibility was to determine the assembled capacity of those streams. And I'm sure about the Okay. So part of my resource assessment was the water quality aspect of it for surface water. Um, we were determining the assembled capacity, which is um, defined as the ability of a water to um, naturally absorb and use um, the discharged substances without the water quality being impaired or aquatic life being harmed. And we were determining the amount of pollutants that could be discharged into those waters without exceeding those water quality standards. So we were looking at current standards, current permit loads, and then we were looking at future current uh, loads. Um, we were also looking at the landscape. So we were looking at current land use, and then we had uh, projected future land use. So uh, in some areas of the state, we did that work. In some areas of the state, we did not do that work. Um, these are the, and you can't see that. Can we turn the lights off? No, we'll turn the whole rest on. Um, there are lots of blue and red lines on here. The red lines are what the waters that are currently not meeting the water quality standard. There's a whole bunch in around Metro Atlanta, but down in South Florida, we have uh, several that aren't meeting a lot of them are related to sediment and they're also related to low DO. The DO standard for the state of Georgia for warm water fish is a daily average of five, not less than four. And in waters in South Georgia in the summertime, oh, there we go. It's going to be completely dark. It's going to be completely dark in here. Don't fall asleep. Um, in South Georgia, a lot of our DOs where the velocity goes to zero, the DO sits and cooks and the DO drops down. A lot of our, our fish have adopted to those water, uh, waters and are able to survive. So um, when we look at aquatic life, we really have to determine what the natural DOs and systems are. We use a bunch of tools in our toolbox to determine uh, and do our computer modeling to determine what those water quality standards are that we're supposed to be met. Um, Georgia DOSA is our workforce. Um, it's, it's a steady state model that we use um, for freshwater streams. We use it under critical conditions. So we use it when what we call low flow, 7Q10. So that's the lowest flow over a seven day period that has a reoccurrence interval of one in, uh, every 10 years. So it happens 10% of the time. Um, Georgia Estuary is a, a model that we use. Um, it's a mid-tide model, steady state. So um, we use that along the coast. RIV-1 is a hydrodynamic model. That means it sh we can carry the flow in the system, and we use that downstream of uh, dams that we have in the state. We also use um, the loading simulation program C++ LSPC, which is a watershed-based model. It takes into account land use, soil types, topography, hydrography, um, and it's basically run by precipitation. You have rainfall that falls on the landscape and flow comes um, off the landscape either into the ground or, or across the landscape and, and brings with it uh, water quality associated with it. And then we have hydrodynamic models that we use um, for our lakes and estuaries. And, um, EFDC is the model that we're using, Environmental Fluid Dynamics Code, and we also use WASP. So those are the, the what's in our toolbox currently. So um, we developed a current, 
similar to the past year, we did all these water quality models with available data. When we did that initially, we were looking back at uh, data that we had through 2007. 2007 was our critical year that we used to calibrate those models. And we calibrated them to existing conditions. So we were going back in time and looking at how the wastewater dischargers, what they were discharging, and using that information plus the water quality data information and historic rainfall to calibrate our models. And then what we did was we ran the models with everybody a permit. And the deal is, under the Clean Water Act, you can't issue a permit that doesn't meet water quality standards. If we find we're not meeting water quality standards when we issue the permit, we have to do what's called the TMDL load. And we have to come up with new permit limits based on that. So we were finding areas where we were over allocated, TMDLs needed to be done, or we hadn't taken into account contributions from non-point sources. So that's what the first round of the statewide water plan was. Then what we did was we took those models and we looked at um, planning them with forecasted flows that we would have had, new discharge locations if we were consolidating plants, if we had new plants that were going to be coming in because we knew that there was going to be growth in certain areas. We also looked at future land use patterns. So we had the uh, University of Georgia, Liz Kramer, who has the Georgia land use trend data, do uh, a couple of models that would determine where future land use was. Um, idea is that future land use typically will appear along a, a, a transportation corridor. You're not going to build a town in the middle of no man's land. You're going to be build it along a, a transportation route. The other thing is you tend to develop next to an area that's already been developed. So if I'm an urban area square, the likelihood of the urban area popping up in the middle of no man's land over there is very unlikely, but the, the idea that it would pop up next to me is much more likely. So this is the type of um, computer model that she used to figure out these land use. So we did a lot of land conversion of, uh, of cropland um, being converted into uh, urban land, but those were on the edges where the urban land there was forestry land that was being converted into crop land. So that was the type of stuff that we did for the future land use. And then we ran those models on those watershed models and did an iterative approach. Again, I can't issue permits that don't meet water quality standards. So when you looked at our future maps, everything met because that was my job. My job is to make sure you meet. So I came up with really tight limits. And that's how come you always when you look at those future land, the future um, the similar capacity models, they always met because I couldn't issue permits that don't meet. But there's things that the, the councils need to consider. Are we going to put in regional plants? Are we going to change over to LASs? So there are some things that we need to think about when we do that. This is what was originally done with the statewide water plan. Um, along the coast, we had these estuary models and these pale purple models here. Um, we had some hydrodynamic models that were done for Savannah River. And we had one down in Brunswick Harbor. Um, we had RIV-1 models, which are these orange models. Again, they're downstream of dams. So the first one we ever built was in the Chattahoochee downstream of, of uh, Lanier that ran to West Point. But we continued down through the whole rest of the system. This is the Flint River downstream of Blackshear. Um, we have the Tusa River up here. We have two lakes that were impaired, Alatuna and Carters. And we had a system where we were dealing with a state line DO issue on the Tusa River. Um, we were dealing with um, nutrient issues going into Lake Weiss, which is over here in Alabama. So we had to deal with those nutrient issues, this watershed had to have some nutrient reductions to deal with stuff that was going on in, in Alabama. Um, these shaded ones here, there's a bunch of light blue lines on this map. All of these light blue lines on this map are the DOSEC models we did. What we did was waste load allocations for the whole state for that statewide water plant. So we did that for the whole state. Um, and then these shaded areas were those areas that we did watershed models for. So we didn't do anything down here in the Suwannee. Um, but we did do the Satillo River Basin because we didn't need to run the So um, 
again, we were, we were dealing with areas that had lakes, large lakes that had standards, um, and trying to figure out what was going into those lakes in order to set standards for them. So that was what was done for round one of the statewide water plan. My work never stopped. So typically when we were doing um, those same models in the past, you have a wastewater treatment plant that would come into a tributary that would go into the main stem. So um, something that's going into the Akawaki River Basin or the Suwannee River Basin, you know, wastewater treatment plant went to the main stem. We stopped. Once it got into the main stem, we said, don't worry about it. It doesn't make any difference. Well, that's not true. So as part of the statewide water plan, what we did was we put all these little models that we had that were separate, and we put them all together. So we had a bunch of tributaries coming in with these wastewater treatment plants, and we put them all going into the main stem because this, this wastewater treatment plant actually affected what was going on here. So that was what we did first round of water plants, putting all of these models together. It was the first time we actually looked at beyond the tributary its impact into the main stem. So, a bunch of work that was done for it. The good news is we can take those models and use them in the future. For the watershed models, we talked about this briefly, is we took these models that are driven by land use, soil types, topography, hydrology, um, and we ran them into lakes. So this is so we had this land use model. It would have rainfall fall on it. Water would flow off, it would take a pollutant load with it, be it nutrients or organic matter, and it would run into the lakes. So the LSPC is the watershed model. We had the flows come in. We had a watershed, uh, the lake model here. That would, we would work on the surface elevation to make sure that the hydro hydrology was right. And any time we do water quality, we have to make sure the hydrology goes right. If you're not getting your water quality first, I mean, the water quantity first, you totally mucked it up. So Jim's, what Jim does is really important to me when you talk to Wade, and he talks about water quantity. Those things are really important to me, because if I don't get that right, I might as well just go home. Then we deal with the water quality aspect of it. So then we're dealing with the water quality coming up with our lake concentrations. The things that we were looking at is we're looking at how do nutrients affect the algae in the lake. And what we're looking at is the chlorophyll. That's the green colored pigment in the, in the lakes. We're looking at the nutrients and we have to break them down because we're looking at the bioavailable nutrients. That's the nitrate nitrite and the phosphates. We're looking at the, the organic matter and how that affects the DO. So those are the things that we're looking at in the watershed models. So again, we built watershed models for the upper Oconee, Okmulgee, all of the Coosa, the lower Savannah, downstream of Thurman, and, and the Satilla River for the, the Brunswick Park. And this is round one. Data that was needed by those watershed models, again, we used hydrography. We used, um, we broke the basins into little tiny 12 inch huts. We used DEM, which is the slope. It's a digital elevation map. It just basically tells you the slope. So water flows downhill. It always goes to the one that's lower elevation than you are. We were using 2005 land use. We were using soils. So that was a set of soils. And we now have a finer soil available that we can put into the models. And it's run by precipitation. We take into account the battle transpiration point source loads, water withdrawals, so we had agricultural water withdrawal. So if you all were rain, it was raining, we knew where the agricultural areas are. We digitized those. We put those in the map, but if it was raining, we did not assume you were irrigating. It's kind of a clever thing, right? We actually took that into account that you didn't irrigate when it rained. Um, we had septic tanks in these models, we also had agricultural practices. So we identified in several of the watersheds in North Georgia where we had nutrient, we identified where these poultry houses were. And we were looking at maps and literally counting them and figuring out where the areas were. Because the practice used to be, 
if I had a poultry house, I would distribute the poultry manure twice a year around the poultry house, on the fields around the poultry house. That's how a lot of those nutrients in North Georgia ended up ha causing problems and getting in the lakes. So we actually created a land use type called poultry. Chicken, chicken houses. Um, and we put areas around that where we actually put the, the uh, land use application in. Um, this is the Coosa River system. Again, it had two lakes. We were doing watershed walks through Lake Alatuna. We did one for supporters. Went into the system. Again, we were dealing with stuff at the state line. And the complexity of how these models all fell together. If I had watershed models for Carters and Lanier, I mean, excuse me, Alatuna, they went into lake models that became boundary conditions for my Rib 1 model, which had the land use coming into that, it's up there. And then those go into uh, a Lake Weiss model where it has its watersheds around it. 85% of the watershed that goes into Lake Weiss happens to be in the state of Georgia. So guess who's going to have to fix the problem in Lake Weiss? It's not Alabama. It's basically Georgia. So what have I done since we did all that work? Um, I got some grant money. And um, our contractor, uh, happened to be the contractor that was also working for Florida to set their nutrient criteria. So when you do a model for Florida, a watershed model that's going into their estuaries, because that's what they were concerned with, is the estuaries, they need to take that into account in all of the watershed. Well, guess what? Georgia ended up getting, and it happened to be the same contract that was doing the work for us as the work for them. We ended up getting for free the blocking in the Suwannee River Basin because they flow into Florida. They then took those models and they Georgiaized them. So they put the septic tanks in it that they didn't have for Florida. They put in the irrigated land use that they didn't have for Florida. They made it a finer time step that they didn't use in Florida. So they made these models similar to the models that we use for um, the statewide water plan. Interesting thing about this model right here, that's the blocking room where it goes into that and, and another one over here, flows in here called the Little River, flow into Lake Talquin in Leon County. Lake Talquin is now impaired for DO and Al. We are working with EPA to develop and refine the models that we've already given them. We handed over our models and said, here, use these models. They are building um, RIV-1 models, uh, and WASP models, and land use models for a lake down in Florida to set a TMDL because it's not meeting its water quality standards. Once they figure that, they're going to come up with a load they're going to sit there and say, here, Georgia, you need to reduce your load by X. So the point sources we're dealing with, you all know Moultrie, right? Cairo. That's it. And there happens to be an industry on the state line that does a lot of nutrients. The rest of the nutrients are probably not point source coming from the ag industry. Nutrient management is going to be huge. It's going to be huge. We are going to have to address it. I would strongly suggest that you get in front of this train rather than behind it. Because it's going to run you over. We need to be in front of this nutrient management. We don't have impairments here in Savannah, Chile yet. We need to be proposing what to do and how to handle it, rather than having somebody tell us what we need to do. Liz, would you? I mean, is that a is that a function of of water flow? Because there's not much flow. There's not much distance between where the headwaters are for those. And I mean, that, there is nothing out there. You know, I mean, you, you, there's agricultural load. I mean. You guys have some idea of what's causing the majority of that agricultural load? Because I have not gotten the model at the state line yet. So no. But I know that they've taken, they run these models. Remember, they're all being driven by rainfall. So what comes down is all being driven by rainfall. 
they've taken out all of the point sources and, and we still have a major problem. And they're going to be converting all of these models to forested and wetlands in order to set these loads. But this is something that we really need to think about and try to get a handle on. So this is one of the things we so we added this up for ended up getting a block piece uh, Swanee and the St. Rivers um, in South Georgia. So those were freebies that they refined for us. We ended up getting the um, St. Mary's Estuary. Georgia EBD went ahead and built a Kupi and the Talapusa, which is this one here. And then we had this nice little special kill. 2011. Yeah, 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 yeah. Remember that one? Okay. The Geechee River, right. We thought, duh, maybe we need to know what's going on in Geechee River. Um, my gut feeling is it might have had something to do with ammonia. Um, it's a nutrient issue. But again, we wanted to know point source and non-point source in this river basin because there are plenty of farms in the Ogeechee River. In the Ogeechee River, I've looked at it, gauges go wacky. So in the summertime, I can tell you that they're pumping out of the system because my gauge upstream will have higher flow than my gauge downstream once I get farm country. I know they're pulling water out. So we want to ensure, we wanted to understand what was going in this system and ended up getting the Osaba sound out of that as well. However, I didn't stop there. I got more money. <laughs> Yahoo! I got more money. So what did I add? I added the whole lower Oklahoma so keep in mind, my responsibility, there's this, like, we talked about nutrient criteria just a little bit last time I was here. Okay, I'm on my third round of writing delays. All right, nobody's from the EPAs here, right? I got no federal agency in the room, right? I'm on my third round of writing delays on nutrient criteria development. So in 2005, I had to write my first nutrient criteria development plan. And it said, oh, we'll have everything done by 14. In 2008, we delayed. And we have issued a, another one in 12. Right now, we're saying we're pushing it all back to 2021. And I have finally convinced them that if you get the downstream water bodies and I can, and I can nail the nutrient criteria I need in my estuaries and my lakes, I've dealt with most of my state because guess who's going to deal with this? I'm going to be driven by what? Florida. They're going to tell me what to do over here. They've already told me what to do over here with Alabama. And then I got Tennessee at the top. And I'm trying to convince them I don't need a nutrient criteria in a stream because if I get the lakes and the estuaries right, Florida's going to tell me how I need to manage that land. Alabama's already told me what I need to do up here. I need a 30% nutrient reduction up here. So I rewrote my plan to say I ain't doing rivers and streams. Do you not think it's important? If I manage the downstream, I'll be managing the watershed. And I somehow have gotten them convinced that maybe that's right. Because right now what we're working on, we change the order we're doing things and we're going to do estuaries next. We're doing lakes first and then estuaries. So those will help me set nutrient criteria for every wastewater treatment plant, and then we'll start having to manage the landscape. Liz, can you can you say how we are? I know there's a prioritization tool that's being worked on. So if we get this money from EPA, or we we, we have money to address the nutrient loading. But if, let's say there's a big pile of nutrient loading, let's just say the Swanee Satilla has a pile of nutrient loading. But the resources available only cover a sliver. Um, at what, do you think we're okay, you know, this is, ag agriculture is voluntary, non-point. Is there some line that, that may that may come in the future? Or do you think in the future that, that, that the EPA would come by and say, well, you know, the resources available to do this to continue to address it on a voluntary basis through 319 money is, is, only, is only this amount. You guys have to come up with some other way of addressing those nutrient loadings. Do I think it's common? 
we had this thing going on of hypoxia in Mississippi. No. Right? When's that coming? They're working on it. <laughs> and then, you yeah. know, what's really surprising, this is really interesting, because I was at a meeting to talk about the estuaries. I thought the hypoxia was like a dead zone, like, you know, like, there's this dead zone. It's the bottom, like, of the estuary. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, yeah, tell me something I don't know. It's, it's not the surface. I, and that surprised me, because I thought when they were talking about hypoxia, they were talking about it was all dead, top to bottom, with no geo. It's just the bottom layer, and I'm thinking, that's what you're worried about? I'm not on there. They wouldn't want me on there. Because I tell them, that's stupid. Of course the bottom's got no geo. All right. I'm not on that council, but um, we want to stay away from it. Right now I'm trying to say, hey, I have healthy estuaries. All of this is healthy. Um, in the state of Georgia, we are reviewing our models that they're developing for Florida very, very carefully. We are looking at it very, very carefully to be able to address how much is really coming from the landscape in Georgia, how much of it is point source. I will tell you that I've got an industry down here. They produce a byproduct as fertilizer. They got a lot of nitrogen, a whole lot of nitrogen. Yeah, we know where some of it's coming from. And they are like a mile and a half from the state line. So they're going to have big reductions there for that facility. I go to every single meeting that they have in Tallahassee because we want to make sure that Georgia is represented and modeled correctly, that they're not slanting us for something that is not our problem. So, um, one of the things that I would say that they're addressing in that prioritization tool that we're using and that integration that we're dealing with is we're looking at where we're going to get this bang for buck. Yeah. We want to fix the areas that are currently impaired. So, we got nothing impaired over here right now. Okay. Uh, do they have historical data or did they just start measuring it down there? They have historical data. And they show a trend of it getting worse or um, it wasn't meeting the DO standard that they had on the books. Now there's a new DO standard. They may be closer to meeting that one. But Florida, Leon County was suing us right and left. And then yeah. I saw that look. <laughs> they didn't want this permit to go into effect. They have challenged every single permit that we have issued. Leon County was all over it um, and they got the voice of the government in Florida and Florida listened to them. There, whether there's real issues is the question. Yeah, how and far back does your data go? Um, Florida gets lots of data because lots of people can collect it. So, I mean, you're talking about 20, they have probably 20 years worth of data. The problem with it is what is what is the appropriate chlorophyll level? Because they set a chlorophyll level and said it's 20. They're like just a slight bit over that. But now they can go back and say, oh, well, if it was all forested and wetland, it would be 10. And that's what I'm scared about, is that they'll go back and say, oh, the standard should be 10. That has me more worried. So I'm worried that they'll challenge Ag. Ag permits in the future. Um, they will, challenge, especially service withdrawal. I'm surprised it hasn't happened yet. But um, and I guess the message you have for this council is, what are you going to do when that happens? How do you want to handle that? How do you get in front of in front of that before that happens? So what's the answer? Liz? How do we do that? We're working together. <laughs> Wait a second, I'm partnering. Hold on, let's see. I have vision thing. I got a partner, right? Well, that's what I was getting at is when the three nights, you know, it, let's just say there's X percentage of, of permits that are users that are impairing flow or causing impairments, therefore contributing to nutrient loading. And then the 319 money we get only can be thrown at 30% of that problem. How does the other 70%? It's uh, a little after 930. Right. But I want to welcome you here to the Lowndes County Extension Office. I'm Jake Price. 
I'm the uh, extension coordinator here, and um, we've got uh, several new agents. I'm going to let them just introduce themselves, and um, so you know who they are. We'll start over here with Josh Dawson. Josh, just tell me who you are. Uh, I'm Josh Dawson with uh, Fort Valley Corporate Extension. I'm the Ag and S Resource on agent here in the county. I've been here for about a year and a half, born and raised. Uh, if you need any help, please just give us a call here at the office. Damn. I'm Dan Fenneman. I'm the Ag and Natural Resource Agent from Madison County. So they let the Gators sponsor every once in a while. Just one at a time. Yeah, we don't want too many. One at a time. Yeah. Glad to be here. Yeah. I'm Gina Keith Lyer. I'm new at the SRG Park, and I'm the new Ag and Natural Resource Agent here in the county. Marlon. Uh, I'm Marlon Ewings. I'm in with Josh this summer. Yeah, he's our intern. Uh, we had him, what, he's here for six weeks? Yeah, yeah we're glad to get him. But uh, um, before we get started, I know we've got folks from different areas. If you could just like start right here. I've got Dr. Tommy Shepard. He's one of our main speakers. He's going to talk about co-ops. But just tell who you are and what county you're from. We'll do it real quick because uh, you know, I'd like to, everybody to kind of know who everybody is. I didn't have name tags today, so I thought, hey, this would be the second best thing. Okay, uh, my name is Tommy Shepard. I work with the Center for Agribusiness and Economic Development in UGA. And I'll give you a little more introduction and background on myself when I uh, talk to you later on. I'm Walt Moore. I'm with the Small Business Development Center here in Mount Austin. I'm Bill Boone. I'm from Worth County. I'm with the University of Georgia Small Business Development Center, part of the agribusiness team. Um, Working Lawns and Griffiths, we live in Lands County. We are growing in Eccles County. Um, Sassan Degrees and a lot of groups. Um, I'm going to Bristol, Wayne County, okay. Okay, he's a, he's a Wayne County man too. All right. Joe, it's up to you. Hello, uh, Joe Franklin from Bullock County, and I'm a producer from San Francisco. Brent Miles, my dad, Mike, we uh, think I am San Simmons, my own. All right. I'm Mark Crawford, I'm a nursery here in Valdosta. Good evening, Sarah Register, Clinton County, South Simmons, Blue Bears. Jerome Tucker, Chairman of the FSA State Committee. We drove. We drove them uh, here in Mount County. Mark uh, Sable from Thomas County, to the Gans, and that's so. okay. The combination going. Tim Farmer and Blackshear of uh, Sassoon, Missouri. Uh, Pam Clark, Brooks County. Uh, Sarah Bryant, Brooks County. Uh, Jeff Hart, Trent Coggins, live in Lowndes County, Farmer, and Lanier County. Jody Ham, Lanier County. We had one more. Tony, can we just say who you are and where you, what county you're from? Okay, uh, Tony Smith, Thomas County. All right, so I know everybody's got everybody's name memorized now, but uh, we're going to go ahead and get started to uh, stay on time. But uh, I just want to welcome you here. If you've never been here, we've got restrooms um, out here. A few handouts on the table here. Uh, basically, some of these are some recommendations for weed control uh, from the University of Florida out right of their uh, citrus handbook and also some insects, um, and those are our main problems that we're having right now. But I'm just going to kind of give you an overview of some of the things that handbook I have observed and seen with Satsumas this year around Georgia. I have calls a lot of times from people from different counties and uh, hear some different situations, and I've tried to just keep a database of what's going on out there and see what kind of problems uh, people have. And uh, we'll start off with the main slide. And uh, that's where the Satsumas are located. Can everybody see that okay? Let me turn the light down a little bit. But uh, these stars are where the counties that uh, people are going to Satsumas. And this is by no means not all of them. I'm sure there are people out there that have Satsumas that I don't know about. But these are the ones that I do know about. So you can, you can probably assume that uh, what the stuff I tell you on this slide is the, the minimum amount. So uh, I don't know how many more people are there um, growing. You may know some people that, uh, that you could tell me about 
after the meeting uh, that are growing sad symbols. But uh, I don't have everybody's name listed, but I do have the counties. So uh, we've got uh, sad symptoms growing in 14 counties, and this is my best estimate: uh, Doherty County, Lanier, um, Bullock, Irwin, Pierce, Clinch, Lowndes, Brooks, Appling, Wayne, Decatur, <coughs> Eccles, Thomas, and Dooley. And so. To me, that equated to about 75 acres of satsumas, and um, most of those have been put in since 2013, so a lot of the uh, trees are fairly new, um, not producing yet, so hopefully in a couple years, two more years, three more years, we should have some uh, production going on. A lot of that depends on the size tree that you do start with. If you start with a bigger tree, you may be producing a little bit sooner. Um, you start with a small one, it may take a little bit longer. But uh, this is my best guess, and basically what I did is added the number of trees up and divided by 140, because that's, on average, you probably put in 140 trees per acre. So that's my best guess on how many acres are in Georgia that I know about. And uh, any, any questions on that? Anybody know about any sad symptoms anywhere else that's not on my list? I guess I got them all. It could be <coughs> All right, most of the varieties that uh, are planted, uh, <coughs> awari, that's the majority. Um, that, uh, that's the variety that was most available um, when most people wanted to get uh, into the sad summer business. And uh, also brown select. Um, there's some brown select out there. And uh, Ukimbro. Most of these are mid to late season, basically November ripening. And the ones on the other side, these are some other varieties that some people have. Armstrong, uh, I'm not going to mispronounce this, Zishan or Zishan. If anybody knows the correct pronunciation, just let me know. Uh, early St. Anne, LA Early, China Nine, and Shiranui. So those are some of the earlier varieties. And I don't know exactly when these are all supposed to ripen up. Mark may have a better idea because he's got a lot of these at his place. but. Uh, you know, a lot of it's really not well known exactly when they um, mature. And uh, as you may know, a lot of these uh, early maturing varieties, they may be mature, but they still may be somewhat green. So uh, that's, uh, that's a factor when it comes to marketing, and it may be mature. <coughs> if somebody sees a green uh, orange, they're not used to that. So that's some information we'd like to get, get more information on, is how these early maturing varieties do here in Georgia. Anybody got any questions on these? Comments? Um, we did have some cold winters this year. Uh, as you know, we did get uh, very cold in uh, mid-November, which is uh, unusual. A lot of times we're looking at our first frost, usually mid, mid to late November here in Valdosta. Some of the surrounding counties may be a little bit uh, different. But uh, we had a hard freeze about the 19th of November, which uh, is, is very unusual for us. But uh, weather is uh, probably our number one concern with growing satsumas. But uh, we did get very cold. And uh, some of the factors that I've just kind of gathered uh, that contributed to some of the uh, tree losses and tree damage, um, some of it was kind of self-caused, um, some things that people could do a little bit different to try to prevent some of it. But uh, one of the things that I saw was uh, not using a trifoliate root stock. So there's a... Uh, other rootstocks out there that can be used, but the, uh, mainly the one that I have seen has had some problems is uh, Carissa. And uh, we have our um, little citrus plot, and we have some Carissa out there, and uh, some of those, uh, probably half of those, got hit really hard, where some of the other ones may have come through a little bit better. But that's just our observation. That's not scientific or anything, but that's just kind of what I'm seeing a little bit. Um, some people did not have uh, adequate wind breaks as we've gone around and looked over the years, and Mark did a nice talk on wind breaks a couple years ago. Um, they're very important. So you need to block that wind usually from the north, mostly from the north and the west side. So wind breaks are something that you really need to get serious about if you don't have a wind break. Uh, fertilizing too late in the year. You know, I've had people that say they fertilized up into uh, September, October. And uh, you don't want to get a lot of that young, vigorous growth going into uh, 
the winter time. So especially this year, if you were fertilizing it too late and we got blasted in November with that hard freeze, that, that could cause a lot of damage. Some people did not have uh, freeze protection or irrigation. And of course, I, I personally would not try to grow satsumas without freeze protection. It's just too risky to try that because we're going to get to 20 degrees um, usually once uh, a year here, you know, or 25. So we're going to get cold. So I, I wouldn't take that chance. Um, <coughs> not turning on the irrigation and trusting the weather forecasts. I, I was guilty of that. You know, I was looking at that, uh, usually we thought we were going to have that one cold night in November, but uh, the next night I was looking, it's going to be 29, 30, so we thought, well, I think it's okay, but it got down to about 24, 25, so it got cold again, so take-home message for me was if it's questionable, go ahead and freeze protect. Um, just run that water, because uh, better be safe than sorry. And, uh, but uh, we didn't lose any of the trees in our test plot that we had on irrigation. But we did have some damage. We have a couple of border roads that we did not have on irrigation. We just had them banked up with sawdust. And uh, a lot of the sawdust settled over the wintertime below the bud union. So you know, we did lose some of those trees that the sawdust settled. But uh, where the sawdust was above the bud union, we came out pretty good. Uh, planting in low areas. If you planted satsumas, at the bottom of a hill, I've heard a couple people say that they had uh, planted in what they considered lower spots and they just didn't own land available. So, you know, that's not a good place to have Anybody lose any other trees for any other reason that you can think of? Too wet. Huh? Too wet. Too wet? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like said the low, low light, low air. Yeah. Just stayed too wet last year. That's very true. If you get a lot of rain and it's not well drained, um, you, it's going to be a, an uphill battle for you. So just make sure you plant them in the right spot. And if you do these things, do everything you can to uh, help protect your citrus trees. Mother Nature's got enough things that she can throw at you without you having any, any contribution to any tree loss. And I just went through uh, georgiaweather.net. That's a weather station that the University of Georgia has. They have weather stations all over the place. And I just uh, went to those two nights just to see what the temperatures read at those weather stations. We have one in here in Valdosta, but it's um, more or less downtown. It's across from the Sam's and the Walmart. So I don't think that's a real accurate reading for um, our um, areas out in the country. So uh, I just used the one in Brooks County just to see about. And usually it's a couple degrees cooler because it's more out in the country. But <clears throat> you can see, um, according to the weather station, Pretty much everybody was at least mid 20s, and some counties did go uh, below 20. So, uh, and I heard reports of uh, you know pretty good damage in some areas, maybe Wayne County somewhere in those areas, Appling, and uh, they did get a little colder when I started looking up this information. So, Brooks about 24, Decatur about 25, Tift, um, Darty got to be uh, 20 degrees. You know, that's uh, that's a pretty good spread for South Georgia. So you just never know what your temperature is going to be. Different areas may have little microclimates too, so you may be in an area that's a little warmer or a little uh, little cooler. But uh, Appling read uh, about 19 degrees. Uh, Wayne was 18, uh, Bullock 23, and Camden um, was 25. You know, I, I looked at the Glen County one, but uh, I think that one's kind of in town too. But uh, that Camden uh, station is out in the in the blueberry field, so it's probably a little bit more accurate. But that's about how cold we got according to the uh, weather stations. Did anybody get any colder than that, you think? <coughs> Sound about right? Okay, uh, different kinds of cold damage. Some of it, uh, this is not all the types, but this is just some of the ones that we kind of encountered. Um, you have uh, up here top right, that's just some foliar damage on uh, some of our trees that we had. Uh, that's not too bad. All those came out nicely. On the uh, left, this is a tree that we banked up. I don't know if you can see it or not, but uh, this is where the uh, scion wood, the bud wood was put in. We had it banked up to about here, and from here it's a very distinct. This is green as it can be, from here up, from here up is as dead as it could be. 
So, you know, this tree was saved, but we have some damage. It's not like, you know, if you say, hey, we saved all of our trees, it doesn't mean they're all looking fantastic and didn't have any damage. But this is a maple that we just put in in our border road. And this, uh, it's growing and coming on nicely. So it's, uh, it's still kicking, so we saved that tree. But it's uh, got some damage to it. Bottom left, this is one of our trees, uh, and it's uh, defoliated. But the uh, wood is still green, as you can see. So that one came back out okay. Uh, we just snipped a few of the uh, dead stems off. But that one came out, it's looking good. But this on the bottom right, you see that one? That's, uh, that one's stone cold dead right there. So that's, uh, that's a pretty, uh, fairly large tree. And uh, you see some of the rootstock coming out at the bottom. You all see that the green sprouts? But there's like a big, big canker there where they had some cambium damage from the cold weather. And this tree, uh, it looked okay in the spring, but they will come out and then it gets kind of warm and the uh, amount of water the tree needs increases, and, but the damage and it just, it just can't make it. So and then it died out. And the, if the leaves stick like this uh, in the wintertime, it's usually, it's usually dead. But uh, that's different, different kinds of damage that we see. What rootstock was that tree on? Oh, where, where was that tree? Uh, undisclosed location. Oh. <laughs> well, what kind? How's that? It's uh, in Lounge. <laughs> I, I saw it. <laughs> uh, but this is, uh, this, most people are using uh, Ponceris trifoliata, which is uh, Rubido, uh, Flying Dragon, and uh, there's some out there called Witch 16-6. And best we can guess, that is very similar to Rubido. And we don't know a whole lot about that, but there are people that have uh, some of that rich 16.6 rootstock, which is a trifoliata, so it, it should be okay. But uh, the ones on Cariso, they, they seem to have a little bit more trouble. And I don't know if anybody else has got any other rootstocks that's not like you know, one or two here and there, but has anybody got any other rootstocks you're trying out? But that's, that's the main two that I have come across. And of course, you know, um, we have a rootstock trial with different types of rootstocks that we're trying out to see if there's any better, but they're all pretty much old, stand, old standards or crosses uh, with the trifoliata and something else. So we're doing a little evaluation on our own to see if there's anything that might be better than, uh, than uh, Rubido or Flying Dragon. But you can see the little canker, the little damage on the front there, y'all see that? <clears throat> All right. Thank Mark Crawford for this picture. And if you've been to Mark's place, this is uh, several years old. Just uh, shows how his place has evolved over the years. But uh, this is, how old are your trees here, Mark? Think. How old are your trees, these Leelands? They're about eight, eight nine years old. Now. Uh, in this picture, what were they? Oh, they were about uh, probably um, maybe three. Three years? But uh, this is a picture of a good windbreak. Um, so we got he's using Leland's here, and uh, basically this is a boxed-in area. But uh, windbreaks horseshoe, are horseshoe, horseshoe area. Yeah, he does have one area that's open. But uh, you know that's a good example of a windbreak, and you can do it in different ways and use different trees. But, you know, like I was saying earlier, do do get you a windbreak. Um, where are trees coming from? So. Uh, it's important to get trees from uh, places where they're less likely to have diseases. We want to bring in any uh, psyllids or citrus cankers, you know, anything, anything like that. And there's a bunch of nasty citrus diseases out there. And uh, we'll go over some of those in a little bit. But uh, most trees are, are coming from uh, Alabama and Louisiana. Uh, Star Nursery, they provided a lot of trees for us. That's where this semi truck load came from. Um, Saxton Becknell out of Louisiana and Texas. Um, and Ray Phillips, everybody probably knows Ray. He's uh, from Alabama. He couldn't make it today. But uh, he's, uh, he's real excited. He's big, big into satsumas and uh, he's uh, provided a lot of trees for us over here. And uh, he's been real helpful on doing that. You know, if he runs out, he can, he can scrape them up somewhere in Alabama, but he, he's come up with a lot of trees that have been planted over here. 